So that was an Allegro number 13 from Giuliani's Opus 50. Follow the lesson for free and pick up a whole bunch of the tips that we'll be discussing. But if you're interested, I do have an edition of all 32 works in Giuliani's Opus 50. There's a link for that in the description. So unlike some of the other pieces that we've encountered so far, this one does not have as clear of a melody. There's certainly melodic material in the bass that carries you through the piece. And even by, you know, popping out some of the upper notes, you might get like an impression of a melody, but for the most part, it's an arpeggio texture that, that has some melodic material and that, that moves you through these great minor harmonies. I don't have too much to discuss. The fingering is, is very straightforward. It's more about shaping the, the texture and making sure you're, you're going through these arpeggios smoothly. And then, then there's a few fingering options that, that I want to discuss because um, I think that in some ways this piece is quite easy, but in another way, the fingering that I've chosen and that other editions choose um, give students a little bit of a challenge. And there's a good reason for that, and we'll, t we'll discuss that. It's a very popular piece. It's in the R RCM books in Canada. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's, it's just like an exciting little arpeggio piece that, that's great for, for people to play and just it can really fit certain situations nicely. So in terms of phrasing, like, I think the bass carries you through the piece um, quite a bit. So, you know, you start off a little bit soft, and then you grow more, more, here, here, and start again, soft, growing. It's a big long cadence at the at the end that kind of spirals, and we'll talk more about that when we do the walk through. There's also some shaping that you can do in the arpeggio itself, so um, you know, like letting there be some rise and fall in the arpeggio. So you can think of it as as two different um, systems of of growth happening. Kind of each harmony keeps growing towards the cadence at into bar five and the resolution at bar five. Uh, but also within each bar, there's a little bit of rise and fall as well in the arpeggios. Growing. You know, so lots of movement and all that shaping really contributes to the forward momentum that the piece has and the excitement level of the piece. So besides that, let's do a walkthrough and we'll just talk about a couple of the oddities in the piece in terms of fingering and why we have to we choose these fingerings. I'll also discuss that sometimes I break the fingering rules for some students in certain situations. So knowing the harmonies of the piece, the chords of the piece, um, can be helpful in this one. So I'll often teach students like, okay, the first bar is A minor. You just take the first beat and play it together, right? The first two beats. And then the next bar is D minor, then E major, then A minor in first inversion. And then E7 in second inversion, and back to A minor at bar five. So those are the, the harmonies of the piece. Letting your left hand know that can help you just recognize the shapes more quickly. I'll go slow. Um, I don't observe the, the second beat rest, but you definitely could. It's written in the score. You would do it by putting your thumb back on the bass note. Mute. He does that and then he sustains some of the notes at the cadence, so it could be quite effective to actually do that. Um, I'm not observing it, I'm letting everything ring out. Usually when I teach this uh, to students, I don't introduce muting until around grade, around grade three, so around this piece, but like uh, for the most part I, I let this one sustain. Switch to third finger here, because if you don't, you kept second finger, you'd have to jump it very quickly in the time frame of a sixteenth note. 
So switching to in bar two, third finger, that way second finger can just grab that next bass note. And same thing here, we want to use our fourth finger here, and then third on A. That way two can grab the B in the next bar, otherwise you'd have to jump that second finger over quite quickly. I'll come back to this later. This is the ideal fingering for legato playing though. And then it's much of the same material after that. No, I'm not shaping much right now, but... Setting us up for the cadence. So from bar nine to the end is just like a long extended cadence. It's just A minor, E7, A minor, E major, A minor, E7, A minor, E major, A. So just one five, one five, one five, one five, one. Those that's like um, chords, the five chord going to the one chord. Um, so uh, the last thing I'll just mention is about fingering. Uh, so on rare occasions, I'll sometimes give this to a student who isn't comfortable with that that fourth finger. Um, you know, placement on, on bar four. One thing I will mention though is that when you play that, if you're even slightly misaligned, you know, your fourth finger won't even be able to reach that note. But if you're properly aligned, you bring this knuckle in and your, your fingers are parallel with the, the strings, you can easily reach that note or the lower one or even an imaginary lower one. But if I'm even slightly aligned, I can't even reach that C. So just make sure your, your posture and your guitar position and the angles are all set up properly. You know, like millimeters count here, you should have like a, a pretty much the headstock at eye level. Your hand needs to be up close to the, the fingerboard, fingers curved, all those good things in order to, to play that easily. And once you do, once you're doing that, you should be able to do that fingering very easily. However, sometimes um, I will give this to a student who needs an energetic minor key piece um, that's fast and, and students often find this piece quite exciting. So I will sometimes let, on rare occasions, let a student play it and just jump their fingers around and maybe there'll be a little bit of a hiccup in the legato. But I really recommend that you actually just spend the time to work out your positions and make sure you've worked up to the piece so that you can use the proper fingering because it is very beneficial to legato. Sometimes in teaching, um, teachers will allow their students to do other fingerings just because the benefits of being enthused about a piece might outweigh um, other developmental issues. Of course, that's not ideal though. So the fingering that I've, I've included in my edition, I think is the best fingering for the legato of the piece and the best for your development. It's a fingering that you'll need to know about for later repertoire, so you might as well learn it now. It's a great little piece, very exciting and uh, nice short and sweet, but some, some nice harmonies too.